you're interested, you can be a part of that. All right, well, uh, let's stand up for the reading of God's Word. I'm so glad to get back into this. I've taken a little bit of a break. Um, we're in uh, John 4. We've been in John 4 for a long time. Uh, Pastor Zane, Pastor Ben did an incredible job opening it up, but as, as I kept reading, I was like, there's still meat on that bone i got to pull off. So uh, I thought, felt, felt that we should get into it a little bit longer. So I've got a long passage to read. So you're going to be standing up for a second because we're going to read the, basically the whole chapter. Uh, you ready? All right, here we go. Uh, now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, Although John himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his sons. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Now, just to stop there, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church think they know their na- her name, Fotini. So there you go. I don't know if that, what that is, but hey, Fotini is her name. So we'll, we'll give it to her. And Jesus said to her, where am I at? Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you, everybody say this together, living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. They think the well is about that. You, know, you can actually go see this well. They, they're pretty sure where they know where Jesus' well, or that, that well is at, Jacob's well. About 151 feet deep is what they think, or what they've measured. Um, where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said, Well, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. Everybody say this there. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. He he is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, everybody say it together, I who speak to you am he. Jesus then, just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together For here the saying holds truth, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him, and he stayed there for two days. 
Many believe because of the word they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed, everybody say it together, the Savior of the world. <sighs> that was a long one. All right, let's pray. Lord, we just ask your presence be upon this message. Lord, speak to us today, Lord, I pray. Open our eyes to see what's in your word. Open our ears to hear what your spirit is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So... Last night, I wasn't going to play this because I just didn't feel like I had time, but I watched it last night from The Chosen, and I just thought, I have got to play this this thing. Anybody seen The Chosen? Raise your hand if you've seen The Chosen. Okay, who hasn't seen The Chosen? Okay, good. You're going to be, you'll be, you'll really enjoy this. This is that scene. Maybe it'll give us. Now, I want to just say this too. They say a few things that maybe are not in scripture, but the Bible says, we just read, that she said, come and here, he told me everything that I'd ever heard. So we're not hearing the whole conversation. This is just excerpts of that conversation. So who knows what all Jesus actually communicated during, the, during that time. But let's watch the, let's talk, watch the video real quick. Would you give me a drink? Did you hear me? That's bad, huh? What? You, a Jew, ask her to drink from me a Samaritan and a woman. I'm sorry. I should have said please. You know, it's not safe for you to be alone out here. Nor you. Why haven't you come with others? Why so late in the day? Don't women come to the wells in the, the cool of the morning? Yeah, well... None of them will be seen with me, so I have to come out now, in the heat, as you have so kindly reminded me. Why won't they be seen with you? Long story. I'd, I'd still like a drink of water, if, if you can spare it. Amazing what a parched throat will do. Aren't I unclean to you? Won't you be defiled by this vessel? Maybe some of my people say that about your women, but I don't. Yeah? And what do you say? I say if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. Really? And I would give you living water. Would. Except that you have nothing to draw water with, and this is a deep well. Besides, what do you need from me if you have your own supply of living water? Long story. But Jewish water is better than Samaritan water. Hmm? That's not what I said. Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well? Your water is better than his? I know Jacob. And everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. Wouldn't that be nice? The water I give will become in a person a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Really? Yes, really. Prove it. First, go and call your husband and come back. I will show you both. I don't have a husband. You are right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. <laughs> oh, I see. You're a prophet. You're here to preach at me. No. Usually the one good thing about coming here alone is I can escape being condemned. I'm not here to condemn you. I've made mistakes. Too many. But it's men like you who have made it impossible for me to do anything about it. How? Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place for true worship. They say that because the temple is there. Yeah. Exactly where we're not allowed. I'm here to break those barriers. And the time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So, where am I supposed to go when I need God? I've never received anything from God, but I couldn't thank him even if I did. Anywhere. God is spirit. And the time is coming and is now here. That it won't matter where you worship, but only that you do it in spirit and truth. 
heart and mind. That, that is the kind of worshipper he's looking for. It won't matter where you're from or what you've done. Do you believe what I'm telling you? Until the Messiah comes and explains everything and sorts this mess out, including me, I don't trust in anyone. You're wrong when you say that you've never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am he. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married. But he wasn't a good man. He hurt you. And it made you question marriage and even the practice of your faith. Stop it. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. You picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day? I am rejected by others. I know, but not by the Messiah. <sighs> and you know these things, because you are the Christ. I'm going to tell everyone. I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temples. Soon, just the heart. You promise? I promise. This man told me everything I've done. Oh, he must be the Christ! <laughs> Hey, wait! Your water! You forgot your um. Okay, we can go home. That was good. <laughs> that was so good. Um, yeah, Lord, thank you for the chosen. Thank you for media today that we can really take something in like that and see how it might have, might have been and you know, add that compassion to it. Well, you know me, I like a little history, so I want to kind of talk for a second about the Samaritans. Um, before we get into it, we got to kind of understand, um, you know, when it helps to have some context and of the people and the places that are mentioned. And so I want to start there so maybe we can have a little understanding of why they were so hated, why they were feeling uh, the way they were uh, about, you know, from the Jews. Where did the Samaritans come from and, and what was their crime? Um, so let's go back about 900 years, King Solomon. Uh, this was David's son over Israel, and uh, Solomon um, disobeyed the Lord um, because he was worshiping other idols. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now let that sink in for a second. <laughs> wow, yeah, I, that would probably lead you astray a little bit. Um, so God says, if you disobey, okay, it's not going to go well for you. And so what happened is he began to follow other gods and worshiping other idols and, and God at the same time. And so um, 
God says, I'm going to take that, I'm going to take the kingdom from you, from your, from your uh, sons. And so he, he dies, his son Rehoboam takes over, and there's a rebellion that actually was stirred up by God. Ten tribes say, we're not going to follow you, Rehoboam, anymore. We're going to appoint our own king, Jeroboam, and we're going to go north. So the ten tribes up north, and um, uh, their capital was Samaria. Okay, so starting to make sense a little bit there. Israel or the northern kingdom, and then they have the southern kingdom, which was uh, Jerusalem and, and Judah and Jerusalem. And so I think we got a picture of that up there. So you can kind of see that's what happened. Uh, the, the, the kingdom was split. And so, but, you know, both nations were really, going, were really going away from the Lord. But Israel, the northern kingdom, really took it. I mean, they went straight into it with idol worship. They were sacrificing their children in the fire to Molech. They were at sexual sin. After 200 years, God says, enough's enough. Uh, he allows the Assyrians to lay siege and capture all of Israel. And uh, when that happens... They took all over. They destroyed Israel. When that happens, the Syrians and many nations would do, they would, they would have a, a way, a strategy of kind of making sure that culture went away. And so what they would do is they would displace the people that were in Israel, and they would say, you're coming to us, to Assyria, the land that's Syria, Babylon area before that, or that was before Babylon, but th that area. And then they sent people from their country into Israel and said, like, okay, just kind of bring your culture, and we're going to just wipe out the culture of Israel. And so that's what they did. They began to intermarry, and thus began a new ethnic group called the Samaritans, and Assyrians and Israel, Israelis. And Samaritans simply just means inhabitants of Samaria, half Jew, half Assyrian. Well, it's an interesting passage. describes a little bit what happens after that. 2 Kings 17 says this, and at the beginning of their dwelling there, these are the new people coming into Israel, they did not fear the Lord because they didn't know God. They, they were, had pagan gods. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, okay, which killed some of them. So the king of Assyria was told, the nations that you have carried away and placed in the cities of Samaria do not know the law of God or of the land. Therefore, he has sent lions among them. And behold, they are killing them because they do not know the law of God of the land. The king of Assyria commanded, send one of the priests whom you carried away from there and let him go and dwell there and teach them the law of God of the land. So he sends a priest of Israel that he had carried away and said, go back. You're going to have to teach these uh, people in this land. You're going to teach them what it means to follow the Lord. And so then I'm going to just fast forward a few verses, 33. So they feared the Lord but also served their own gods after the manner of the nations from whom they had been carried away. So what happens, the people of Israel develop this kind of uh, mixture of Judaism and paganism. Uh, we, we call this today syncretism. It's a mixture of a little bit of things, and we still have it today. A little bit of this, a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of humanism, a little bit of mysticism, a little bit of Buddhism. I take all those things, and I pull them together, and that's my religion. That's my truth, right? It's alive and well today. I can call myself a Christian, and, and, but, but have a little bit of all these other things. I don't really prescribe to the view of heaven and hell. I don't really prescribe to God's view of sexuality, all these kind of things. Uh, we, we're really, what I would call it is progressive Christianity. That's what it is. It's, it's a little bit of things from all over the place. It's not really from the Word of God. It's from all different places, and, and everybody did what, what was right in their own eyes. And so... The Samaritans, they followed the first five books of the Bible, uh, the Pentateuch, but they had, they had actually changed some things in the Bible. And so they changed the name of the mountain in which um, Moses got the Ten Commandments, Mount Sinai, and they changed it to Mount Gerizim. So when they're reading, they said, this is the mountain where the law of God was is that's the, that's, and that's the mountain that she's talking to. She's probably pointing to it and say, you know, our ancestors worship on this mountain, Mount Gerizim. Okay, so 200 years later after that, Judah, the, north, the southern kingdom, has its own issue and challenge, and they are destroyed by the new empire of the Babylonians. They, they destroy Jerusalem. They do the same thing. They send the Jews into exile into Babylon. You guys following me? Everybody follow me? 70 years later, somebody said no. That's okay. I heard it. 
Uh, 70 years later, they've been destroyed. They go back into the land, okay? When they go back into the land, I'm, I'm telling you why there's this battle. We're about to read something. They go back into the land, and they're going like, we, and I've got, there's a couple, yeah. And this is what they see. That, you know, this is a picture of, I mean, a gra- drawing. But they see this land that's just completely desolate. And they begin to rebuild Jerusalem, the southern kingdom, right, Judah. They begin to rebuild Jerusalem. And the Samaritans who were their, their, kind of their half-brother, I guess you could say. There. They come to the people of Judah rebuilding their land, and here's what they say. They approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing him ever since the day of Esar Hadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, this is in the book of Ezra, but this, Zerubbabel was the one who put in charge of, of the temple, Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers of houses in Israel said to them, You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God. We alone will build it to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded to them, commanded us. So they said, Samaritans, you, you're not going to be a part of this. Not going to be a part of this. And they rightly did this because the Samaritans probably had a political agenda. They're thinking, okay, we can, we can come together and build an alliance here, but let's join together. But Ezra said, Ezra knew that they, they don't worship the same God we worship. We don't want them having a stake in the new temple. Well, you can imagine this creates a firestorm. Hey, th- this is our brothers, and you, you're saying we can't do anything. We can't come alongside with you. This builds this hatred between the two groups. And, and in Nehemiah, um, they are building the walls of Jerusalem again. And the opposition is T- Tobiah and Sanballat. Do you know who they are? They're Samaritans. So, they're, so th- what's happening is, you know, Nehemiah and their group, they've got hammers in one hand and swords in another, and they're trying to rebuild the walls, and they're getting attacked by people who are saying, I don't want you to rebuild the walls. And who is it? It's the Samaritans. So now it's got personal. It's gotten personal. And so they hated the, they hated the, sin, the, the Samaritans more than they hated the Gentiles. Um, it was personal. And uh, this, was, this was pure racism. This is pure racism, even though you, are, you know, I don't like that word because racism is a human construct. We're all one human race. Everybody say amen to that with many ethnicities. Um, but, but this is what was happening. So let's get back to our story here. I love how, what Jesus said. Well, I break these the societal norms, all right? Je- Jesus busts through this. This is what he does. The gospel breaks down the barriers of racism. Everybody say amen to that. Breaks it down. Listen, Galatians 3. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. All one. If you're a follower of Christ, you should have no part of racism. And if it's in you, you need to ask the Lord to root it out of you. Root it out of you. And, and we all have prejudices. Come on. You know, we, we act like, oh, yeah, that, we're all there. We all have prejudices against somebody. We ask the Lord to root it out of them. But let me give you something else that's really important here, that what Jesus does, and, and he's showing us a way as the evangelist, um, as a, as, a, as a Christ follower, our job is actually to be a bridge. We're, we're to be a bridge. We know our, let, me, let me just say, we know our identity in Christ, so somebody else's identity shouldn't scare us. Shouldn't scare us. And so our, and that's what Jesus said, I don't care what your identity is. I know who I am. I'm telling you, I'm here to build a bridge. So the Jews and Samaritans had no way of seeing eye to eye. They just don't even, you know, they would walk around. They'd go the long way just so that they wouldn't have to be around them. But Jesus changed all that. And he, it will take Jesus to change what we are seeing now. Um, Man tries to change minds. The gospel changes hearts. Let me say it again. Men try to change minds, but the, only the gospel can change the heart. It changes the heart. So you change the heart, and you're going to change the mind. And uh, we have to be the change agent. So, so here's what I want to I speak to something here that's a little bit, little bit, uh, a little dicey here. What we do as a society, okay, is no different than what the Jews did. We put people in categories. 
We create a narrative around them, a stereotype. We demonize them, we dehumanize them, and we forget that everyone is made in the image of God and somebody, everybody, somebody Christ, Christ died for that person. We forget. Let me, give you, let me give you a couple of examples here. Okay, here we go. Everybody coming across that border, that southern border, is criminals, they're drug dealers, they're terrorists. Right? No, not everybody coming across there. But do you know what I'm saying? That's, that's what's being said. Is, is that true? No. There's some people. I, it, it's illegal. All that kind of stuff. Hold on. Before you get freak out here about my... Yes, I can already hear some of you starting to freak out. Where's he going with this? Not everybody goes across the border, though. Some of them are looking for... They're, they're in big trouble. They're looking for asylum. They're looking for a refuge. You know, we can live... In a place, I heard somebody say this the other day, Pierce Morgan said this, and I've been thinking about it all week, that great theologian, Pierce Morgan. (laughs) There can be two truths at one time. One truth can be this. Yes, we need to secure the border. Yes, we need to make sure, because it's, it's, it's it's a humanity issue. Yes, we need to secure the border. Yes, we need to make sure who's coming in. We need to vet who's coming in. Yes, we need to protect our borders. And at the same time, those people coming over need to be loved and cared for and shown that Jesus is the way. You gotta, it's like these two, two truths you got to live in tension in. I mean, it's the same thing we, we, you know, we, we heard last week. The culture says this is Pride Month. We've re, renamed it as Life Month. Uh, yes, amen, it's Life Month. But not every person in the LGBT agenda is has the plan of going after our children some of them are just confused and they're hurting we just heard it last week like ken williams just i'm hurting i'm hurting i'm hurting can we live in a place where we say i love you and i care for you and i want jesus to 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 save your life I, i i'll be your friend but at the same time say i don't think my children need to be around this this is not safe for my children to be around we can live there muslims the same thing not every Muslim is an extreme radical, okay? Can we love them? Can we pray for them? Can we talk to them about Jesus and at the same time recognize their ideology is destructive? You see, that's what the Jews were doing, though. They put all the Samaritans in this lump category. They dehumanized them. Don't go near them. Don't just despise them. And they missed an opportunity to love them. And, and, and as Jesus, as Christ followers, we actually have a... a Something, the love of Christ compels us to say, hey, I'm going to step in. And when everybody else is fighting, I can be a bridge builder with the love of Christ. And so I want us to look how Jesus, the master evangelist, does this. We're going to really study his, his evangelism um, strategy today. Um, so number one, he's the first one to reach out. He's the one who said something. We need to be the one... Because sometimes nobody will say anything but just yell and scream at each other. We need to be the one to say, hey, I want to find common ground with you. He asked her for a drink. A common need. She fi- clearly felt the culture shock and all this. But, but you're talking to me, a Samaritan woman. But I, I want to encourage you this week. I, I just want to put this, give you some homework. I want you this week... When you see a group of people that you have felt like maybe a little bit of that, just smile at them. Ask them a question. How are you doing today? You know, I mean, I've been really doing that a lot more. Just people that I would normally was like, you know, would not be. But I'm like, I'm going to go out of my way to let them know that 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 I care for them. You know, it's okay to talk to people, a Muslim, about their religion and what they love about it, to find a bridge. It's okay to have the conversation. They're they're not going to, it's not going to impact you, infect you. It's okay. It's okay to befriend people that don't vote like you or think like you. It's okay. It is okay. Find common ground. Find something you can agree and talk about. I just feel like as a culture, we've forgotten how to be interested in other people. We, we just don't care. It's like, oh, you are, you know, you, I can't go near you. You're a bad person. Why? Because you're, in, you're associated with that. You know, I just want to say, I don't have time to say this, go into this, but I will for a second. We do it in churches. 
I can't tell you how many, I mean, I've been, we've been pastoring for six years, and I can't tell you how many times that we've heard somebody say, and multiple times, say, yes, yeah, so-and-so, uh, I, was, I, I was talking to somebody about me going to this church, visiting the church, and they said, oh, I wouldn't go to that church. And you're like, why? Because we believe that God still heals, and we believe in the gifts of the Spirit, and they're like, that church, I would stay far away from them. What? We're just following the Word of God. We're just following what the Word of God says. But we do this in churches all the time. Well, they believe that. Don't go near them. Don't, you know, and I, I get it. Yeah, if there's something's out of whack, that's a different story. But we do this in churches too. We're so afraid. We're so afraid. So I, I just, my encouragement to all of us, be bridge builders this week. Start, just do something to be a bridge builder. Okay, number two. He offers her something she could not get herself. Living water, the truth. Now, I want you to think about this. A shepherd goes to a well, and he draws out of the water, okay? And the sheep come, and I, I was watching some videos. I should have got one up there, but they're watching, and they're, and they're pouring water into these troughs, and they're drinking the sheep have no way of getting the water themselves. They need a shepherd to draw it out. Let me just tell you, Jesus is offering living water, and there's no other place in the entire world for you to go to get it. It's Jesus. You think other places are going to help you? You think other things are going to satisfy, and they might for a short time, but nothing satisfies like Jesus like I said, we're not trying to change people mind, people's minds. We're not trying to get them to live differently. I mean, we want that, but we're not condemning them. We are simply offering, as an evangelism tool, we're simply offering them something that they can't get themselves. Jesus. We've got to stop overcomplicating this. You don't have to have a deep theology. You just bring them to Jesus. We're going to see in a few minutes what the woman did. She, she didn't have a theology degree. She met him one time, and she's out there being the evangelist. Our job is to just bring them to Jesus, let him pull the water out and drink. You don't have to change the way, their way of thinking. You don't have to change how their, their attitude or behavior. Let God worry about that. I just want to bring you to Jesus. Bring you to Jesus. Number three, what did he do? He doesn't affirm her sin, but he simply says there's a better way. He didn't condemn her. You going to hell, you sinner. But he didn't affirm it either, did he? He didn't affirm it either. He doesn't condemn, but he also doesn't affirm. He calls out the sin. She knew that it was wrong. And I think you know this, but you don't have to agree with somebody in order to love them. You don't have to agree with everything they're doing in order to love them. And I think sometimes, you know, it's okay to just say, look, I don't think this is the best way for you. God's ways are best, but you don't have to go along with it. You don't have to participate it. You don't even have to be quiet about it. You can just minister them. And people think sometimes that if I say anything about what these people are doing in my life, I'm going to lose the relationship. I, I can't say anything about what's going on. I'm going to lose the relationship. If I have standards, I can't say anything about them because, you know, I just, I'm just loving on them. Well, you don't have to condemn them and make them feel shame and you're going to hell, but you don't have to affirm it either. You can speak truth. This is not good for you. Let me show you another way. Man, let me tell you about what happened in my life. Jesus redeemed me. He healed me. He restored me. I mean, you, you, heard, you heard him say it on there. Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah and did that to nobody else. Think about that. He had compassion on her. He loved her. Now think about this, too. She ran around telling the entire place... He had just called out all her sin. Do you think if she felt condemned, she would be going around telling everybody, let me hear it. Do you want to hear the guy who told me everything about it I've ever done? No, he, he somehow in his love and compare, he said, love in his, in his highlighting these things, 
She felt love and not condemned. She felt it. And number four, what does he do? And this is what we're going to spend most of the time on today. He corrects her view of God. And this is, I think, is really important for us. Because this is the thing, if you talk to people who are struggling with, their, you know, with following Jesus, this is usually the, the point where they, they, you know, they can't seem to get through. It's because they have a view of God that's incorrect. They have a, they have a wrong view and understanding of God. He actually says, how you think about God is wrong and it's false. Let me show you, show you another way to think about God. I, I, let's read this together. Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Now listen to what he says. You worship what you do not know. That's a big statement he just made. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all these things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, I want us to say something real quick. Maybe you're watching this. Maybe it's a year from now and you're watching this. Or maybe you're in here and you're struggling. You're coming. You're thinking, man, I'm, lots of stuff is going on in my life. I'm hurting. And I think maybe church is the answer. And I, I, just, I just want you to hear the words of Jesus. I who speak to you am he. Jesus is the answer. He's the answer to anything you're going through right now. He is the answer. Jesus is who you're looking for. Today could be the day that you put your faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So I love this verse. Because Jesus said, it doesn't really matter whether you worship on that mountain, Gerizim, where they worship on this mountain, where they go to Jerusalem. It doesn't, it's not going to matter because everything's about to change. The whole thing's changed. I'm destroying the whole system. <laughs> You're going to be able to worship anywhere in spirit and truth. And he says, you don't know who you worship for salvation is the Jew. He's correcting this theology about God. Now, A.W. Tozer says this, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Is he near or is he far? So that's how you're going to relate with him. Is he near God? Is he a far God? Is he a loving God or, and good or is he a tyrant that goes around and killing people? Which one is he? Does he know us intimately or is he a God who's just kind of an innocent bystander? Or we could say, is he a good father or is he the Godfather? How you think about God, see, you understand a lot of people come to Christ and they're think, they're, they, because of influences and things that they've gone, they have a view about God and they cannot see Jesus correctly because they have this filter that they view God. Well, God's mean and evil. He doesn't care about me. The enemy's been talking to him for a long, long time. That's his, that's his plan. And, and Jesus is not so much pointing to how important the Jews are. That's not what he's really saying. But, but he's, he's, he's pointing to salvation comes from the Jews, that the knowledge of God is, comes out of the Jewish people is what he's saying. And that your worship, this Samaritan religion, is false. Now, I want to talk about worship for the last few minutes that we've got. I want to make a few statements. What is worship? What is worship? Okay, the Greek word Jesus used here is proskuneo, which means that's where we get the word prostrate. Not prostate, prostrate. Um, which means to bow down. Okay, to fall down, to give reverence. If you take the English word, if it's broken down, you take the English word, worship, it's worth ship. Worth ship. Think about that. What you give worth to is what you worship. So if you think about it through that, that term right there, so we can, we, you know, we read in the Bible all about worshiping idols. Well, we can worship an idol because anything we put above God becomes, a worship, becomes something we worship and an idol to us. 
Anything we can give. Worship is a whole lot more than just music, okay? It's a whole lot more than music. Status can be an idol because we worship what people think about us. We worship man. That's really what it is. It's a fear of man. We worship. I want people to think I'm, I'm amazing. I'm beautiful. I'm, uh, I have a lot of good things. I want people to see my car. I want people to look at my child a certain way or what college they go to, what I live in, what I drive. All those things can become, now there's nothing wrong with those things, but when they become more important than God and what God thinks about you and you care more about what people think, it becomes an idol in your life. Relationship can become an idol. A girlfriend or a boyfriend, God's telling you to do something else, and you're like, oh, I just don't want to lose this. They become an idol. You've put more worth in what they say than what God thinks. A child can become an idol. I care more about what's going on in their world, and, and I care more about that they're happy and they get all the things they need than I care about what God's saying for my child. Right? A dream or a goal can become an idol. Oh, man, I, I've, money can be an idol. I've got to get there. I've, 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 I've had lots of friends who say, if I'm not a millionaire by 30, I've failed. It's like, I'm like, is that really the, that, that's entire life? That's, that's, man, make an impact on that. Okay. There's a lot more to life than, be, than money. I mean, I wouldn't mind being a millionaire by 30 either, but, you know. But if that's the only goal in your life and not how to fulfill the call of God on your life, okay, you've made it an idol. Let me ask you real quick, maybe the Holy Spirit's knocking on your door right now. Have you put anything and given it more worth than you've given to Jesus? And you need to confess that idol before the Lord. So... Jesus is saying to the Samaritan woman, he's saying, your worship is false, meaning it's not accomplishing anything with God because it's not done in spirit and in truth. You see, what happens, this is the, this is the amazing thing about Jesus, okay? Because when we, when we, when we, we make money or status or popularity or people, when we put more worth on them, okay, Somebody always loses in that world. You understand that? When they become more important, somebody else is less important. Here's the thing about Jesus that I love. And, and the thing is, because none of those things satisfy. They, they satisfy for a while, but they never really satisfy. Here's the thing I love about Jesus. When you put him first, everything in your life wins. Because love is not jealous. When you love him first, he says, I'm going to make sure your kids are taken care of. When you love him first, I'm going to make sure your needs are taken care of. I'm going to make sure all these things in your life are taken care of. When you put him first, everything in your life wins. It's beautiful. So worship is more than singing. It, it really is our entire lives can be worship. But I want to take a, just a moment here with, with our last few minutes. And I want to talk about worship as the act of worship what we just did this morning in corporate and personal, that kind of thing. Let me just say this. Worship is a supernatural experience. Okay, I got the one amen. I love it. Amen. Worship is a supernatural. You are communing with an eternal being, God who created you. You're having communion with him. I, I mean, I want you to think about that for a second. Worship is a supernatural experience. How many in here can testify that it was during a worship time, whether it's here or somewhere else, that, you, that you've had some real encounters with Jesus? Yeah, lots of hands. Hopefully we'll have lots more hands go up soon. So worship literally means to bow. We just talked about that, to, to prostrate. And what it is is the act of bowing your will to his. That's what it is. And this is what we, somebody has been laughing. That's why, Jesus, why God called Israelis stiff-necked people. I can't get you to bow. You won't bow. And why is that so important? Because the Bible says broken in a contrite heart, God will not despise. He opposes the proud. He can't work with pride. They just can't do anything with it. So worship 
is the way to the heart of God. It's a spiritual act of you, of your will, bowing to the will of the Father, saying, not my will, but your wills. I'm done trying to figure this out on my own. I give up control. I do it right here. And it can happen every single day of your life. Worship is coming into alignment with God's will, allowing him to transform us. So I want to talk about this word that he says. This is really important because Jesus, he turned everything when he said this. From now on, you're going to worship in spirit and truth. I want us to say this together. If we can put that spirit. Everybody read this together. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Well, that's a big statement. You must. If you're going to worship him, you've got to worship him in spirit and truth. Anything else, you're not really worshiping. And you may think you're worshiping, but it doesn't have the transformative power that it's supposed to have in your life. So we're, let's, let's dig into this for a second. So there's a lot of meanings to this, and there's a lot of people that have thrown out lots of meanings of what Jesus is talking about. It's, remember, the Bible's an onion. We can keep peel, peeling back later, but I'm going to take a stab at it, okay? I'm take a stab at what I think what this is meaning. Okay, so let's take truth first. We'll start with truth. What is truth? Jesus said, you don't worship, you, we worship what you do not know, meaning you are doing a spiritual act devoid of the truth, okay? So worship has to be tied to a truth, it has to be tied to a truth. We can't just worship to how we feel. We can't just worship to, well, this is my desires or this is experience or just emotionalism. We, we're, then we're just being spiritual, but we're not being transformed, Worship has to be tied to truth. It doesn't matter where you're worshiping at, because he just said it. It doesn't have to be in here. It can be anywhere. It can be in your car, but it has to be tied to truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when we're talking about worship, there's like a lot of things. You can talk about, well, the only way to worship the Father is through Jesus. So that's truth. But then also when we're talking about the way we worship God is the truth of God, we're, we're singing, we're speaking, we're declaring the truth of God, the word of God, Jesus' character, his word, and this is where the problem is in the church because, you know, 6%, the latest study, 6% of Christians, practicing, professing Christians, have a biblical worldview. Only 6%. Because we don't read it, we don't meditate, we don't, we don't remember how many minutes a day? 12 minutes, okay, when I was in, I, yeah, 13. Okay, so, so this week I was like, okay, because somebody said in um, membership, it doesn't take me 12, 15 for easy. So I, yes, okay, Char- I wasn't going to point you out, Charlotte. But, uh, and so I began this week, I began timing myself to make sure that what I said was true. You did, okay. What'd you get? Oh, look at that. Oh. Okay. Okay. Well, a couple days I got like eight or nine because I'm, maybe I'm a faster reader. And then a couple days I got like 15. So, you know, time and all. Okay. But anyway, all that to say. Here's the problem. We can do a lot of spiritual things and not be transformed because it's not tied to truth. You shall know the truth and you shall be set free. We can have spiritual experiences. Whoa, man, I felt that Holy Spirit right there. I felt him. But if we don't have the word of God backing that up and actually transforming our lives, we just had a spiritual experience, but we're not transformed. It's the truth of God that transforms us. Now, I'm I'm gonna get myself in trouble here, but because I'm going to pick a song that a lot of the youth sing. Oh, everybody. Some of the old timers are like, oh, here we go. <laughs> but listen, listen to these words. I'm, I, I'm not saying it. Are you putting, did I put that up there? I didn't think I even put that up there. Okay. So come down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you're moving. Now, nothing wrong with seeing those words, but is there truth in there? But there's my truth, though, how I feel. And I'm not saying we shouldn't sing all these songs, but if we, it's all, that's all we sing, and we're like eating cotton candy all day long, okay? We're not eating the meat. Now, I want to read another song called How Great Thou Art. 
O Lord our God, my God, when I an awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I, see, I hear the rolling thunder, the power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, everybody say, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think of God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can't take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and he died to take away my sin. Doesn't that just do something in your spirit, man? Your spirit man leaps at that. Because truth is being expressed. It's true and it has the power to set you free. And so worship starts with truth. But let me just tell you, many times we are like the Samaritan woman. We don't know who we worship. We have no clue who we worship. Um, we haven't deposited truth in us so that as the spirit side of our worship comes alive, we don't have the truth that's been deposited and anchored in our soul. And it's like, yeah, I feel something, but there's this whole nother revelation that happens when the truth of God has been deposited in us. We've been reading the word. We've been reading our, and our just soul shouts out, how great thou art. And you know what? When we're singing how great thou art, all this truth starts coming out because I can think of all that God's done and who he is. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's the bright and morning star. I begin thinking about all these things because I've deposited truth in me. So this is a really important thing what Jesus is saying. If we're just worshiping spirit, like, man, I'm feeling this in the spirit, and we don't have any truth, we're actually missing out on a major part of worship. I met a couple, and I don't want to steal their thunder, um, but because uh, uh, I'm going to have them share their testimony, so I won't even say their name. But, but we met just recently joining the church, and we baptized them four and a half years ago. And um, the husband had a spiritual experience when he was baptized. He felt the spirit of God. He said, I felt the Holy Spirit. But he wasn't transformed. They began to have some issues in, in, in uh, marriage and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, it was two or three years later, stopped coming to church, two or three years later, that um, they were in a real bad spot. And he said, I don't know what to do. And he cried out to the Lord. And uh, he said, Lord, I need a mentor. I need somebody to show me. And the Lord told him in the shower, he said, uh, you don't need a mentor. I'll be your mentor. And he began to read the word of God. He read it, I don't know, over the course of a year and a half, three times, cover to cover. Totally transformed his life. I mean, early 30s. Totally different person. He said he went to um, a hangout at a um, reunion, and they're, uh, you know, school, high school reunion. They're like, who are you? You're not even the same person. Why? The truth of God. The truth of God. So powerful. And it's not my truth, it's not the world's truth, it's not what the media says, it's God's truth, okay? It transforms us. But, okay, let me just go finish here. Oh, man, I'm running out of time, I'm sorry. You guys getting this? You with me? Okay, good, all right, well, then you just gave me another 30 minutes, okay? No, I'm just kidding, I'm joking. Okay. Jesus then say, says that truth is not a just cerebral act, it's also a spiritual act, okay? See, some people will engage their spirit but not have the truth to black it up. But then some, other, some people, on the other hand, will speak truth but never engage their spirit in worship, okay? They never operate with the Holy Spirit to worship. Worship is not a physical act. God is spirit, so if you're going to commune with God, it must be done on a spiritual level. So worshiping in spirit is engaging our spirit in worship. It's not just singing with our mind. It's singing with our heart. Now, how that happens, I don't understand. That's, a, that's an amazing thing that we're able to do, but you know it when you've sung with your heart. And you can't engage in this type of worship unless you've been born again. Because the Bible says with that, that in, before that, you're dead to God. You, your spirit man is dead. But when you're born again, 
you now have a connection and communion with God and you have the ability to commune with God in worship. I want to read this scripture, Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, which is your, everybody say, spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's being transformed into somebody else, okay? This is worship is transforming you, is what he's saying. Spiritual worship always involves a sacrifice. It always requires a death. And that's us. When we come into worship, we can worship with our truth, with our mind, but we don't really walk into spiritual worship until there's the death, the death of our will, of our lives. And we lay down and say, Lord, in this time of worship here, Lord, I lay myself down. Not my will, but your will be done. The heart begins to open up to the things of the Lord, the Spirit of God. The powerful truth. Another spiritual part of spiritual worship is being led by the Spirit. You know my favorite verse, don't be drunk with wine. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> For that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. See, God wants to lead us in prayer. He wants to lead us in singing new songs to him. He wants to reveal things to us. He, he directs our worship. He directs our prayer. Things come to our mind, and we're like, I wasn't thinking about that before, but now I begin to think about it. Well, that's the heart of God. A lot of us struggle and say, well, this is just emotional. Emotionalism. This is just emotionalism. No, it's learning to be led by his spirit. Let me ask you something, a real strong question. Do you believe that prayer works? Okay, there you go. I feel good about that. What's 1 John say? Five. And this is the confidence we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. How do we find out the Lord's will? Through his word and through worship. How do we find it out? We find out because we lay down our will so we can start listening to his will. And that's what happens in worship. We bow down. We die to ourselves. We die to our will. And what happens is all of a sudden the Lord says, okay, now I can start speaking to you. Before, you were about worried about your agenda. Now I want you to get on my agenda. And it only happens when we bow down. In our hearts, we would like lay it down. Worship gets us to the place where we can lay down our will. We can listen to his will. He will start directing us to pray and sing things that we never... What, where did that come from? Where did that come from? Man, I just... I st have you any, anybody been in worship and all of a sudden you start singing about something very specific the glory of God or the holiness of God. Well, that's not just you. That's the Lord worshiping, the Spirit of God worshiping through you. The, the, the Spirit, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit communing together and, they're, and you're combining with your Spirit and you're worshiping and the Holy Spirit's guiding you, guiding you. Many of us never get to this place in our worship time because we're so afraid of emotionalism, we never engage our spirit. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 14, 15. What am I to do? What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. I will engage my mind, and I will engage my heart my spirit. Wow. The Lord wants to take... Many of you in the place of worship that you've never been before, you have just been cerebral in your mind, singing the truth of God, but you've never engaged your spirit in worship. Elizabeth, you'll come up here. So I want us to finish real quick, and then we'll, we'll just, um, maybe we'll, we'll sing just something real quick, but... What Jesus was doing as evangelist, he was, he was showing her her wrong view of God. You're worshiping something that you don't know because you have a wrong view of God. The challenge we face today as evangelists, all of us are, is we need to help, see peop help people see God correctly. 
The enemy has used all their influences, all the things in their life to help them to think, see Jesus totally differently. That's what Satan did in the garden, right? God, did he really say that? He's just trying to hold back from you. Through our words, through our deeds, we have the way we live our life, the way we love, all this stuff, we, we actually are carrying the love of Christ. And you don't know it, but you're actually showing people how to love. You're showing what the Father looks like. And they're going, that's not what I thought. I was just talking to a girl that um, she was struggling. Um, or, or She's kind of in this process of, of coming to Christ. She's working through that. She said, everything I've known about Christians where I grew up were, were Christians were legalists, they were mean, self-centered, always fighting one another. And I began to explain to her how the, we're, the church is actually the family of God. And we're brothers and sisters that love one another and take care of one another. And she said, oh man, I need that. I've never seen that before. What was I doing? I was opening up her mind to see what Christ had to offer for her. See, we think we have to know a lot of stuff to be able to witness to somebody. No, we don't. We just need the love of God and we need to bring them to Jesus. I love this point because at the end here, it says, do not say there yet four months. Then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes. See the fields are white for harvest. You know, it was usually take about four months between sowing something and reaping it. And Jesus is saying, with the gospel, it's totally different. People are ready for the picking now. And what's beautiful is that picture that the disciples would have seen because the Samaritans would have, they generally would dress in white and they would have white turbans. And so what they're seeing is they're walking through the field and Jesus is saying, don't you hear, hear? it's normally four months, but look, can you see the harvest is white? ready for the harvest they're looking at all these Samaritans coming forward beautiful picture Matthew says the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest so what John teaches us through Jesus is where to be a bridge where to be a bridge where to love and not condemn not affirm either We're to offer them Jesus and we're to show them a correct view of God. Every one of us can do this. It might just be Jesus loves you. You know, God actually has a plan for your life. What he does? Yeah. Oh, wow. I never thought about it that way. Let's bow our heads for a second here. I just want to give an opportunity. Um, We've been trying to do this almost every week, you know. If you're here and you're saying, well, I want to worship in spirit and truth, but I'm not a believer. I don't don't know Christ. Um, I've never accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Maybe you're watching online right now. Would anybody with eyes closed, head bowed, just, just so that you can focus and... Would anybody be in here want to raise their hand and say, hey, pray for me. I'd like to receive Christ. Anybody in this room? Anybody? Amen. Amen. Um, What I would ask you to do is um, just text whenever you get a chance. Life in Jesus, one word. We have a thing up there, Life in Jesus to 94,000. Somebody likes to, would like to pray with you. Um, we'll be available afterwards. Some of us will be down here if you want to come and get prayer. But if, if you'd like to receive Christ, I want to do that. But I just want us to pray. Let's all stand up here. Can we, can we just worship for, I know, I know it's a little late, just two, three more minutes. Is there something we can lead that's real familiar that everybody know that we could just worship, worship him?
to sing that again here, but before I do, I just, if some of us, we need to, um, we need to lay down our will this evening, this morning, and just lay our will down and say, Lord, I'm done striving. I'm done fighting. I'm done trying to be in charge. I give you full control. That's going to be your spiritual act of worship, a living sacrifice. It's laying yourself on the altar. I want you to do that right now here. And as we sing this again, it becomes a real true place of worship. Lord, I'm singing truth. Your name is great, but I'm also laying down my heart. I'm laying down, Lord. I say, God, and all of us can do this. Every one of us needs to do this. Every single day, we take up our cross. We deny ourselves. But but some of you have never done that, Lord. I lay myself down I, on the altar today. Your will, not my will, be done. Let's sing it one more time. Sing, I give glory to your name. I, I give, give glory, glory to your name. Oh, Lord, glory to your name. If you feel comfortable, just lift up your hands and worship. Yes, Jesus, we worship you. And I give glory to your name. You're so worthy. So worthy. Glory to your name. For your name is great. wants to take many of us, all of us actually I should say, into a deeper place of worship a deeper place he wants to show you things in the spirit, he wants to reveal things he wants to help lead and direct your worship, direct your prayers, he wants to do all that, those things some of you need to start pushing putting truth down inside of you, you need to start putting truth more and more inside of you like I need to start reading, I need to get this stuff because it's the thing that transforms my life so I'm going to just pray and release you guys, but uh, I'm going to have her just continue to worship. If, you, if any of you guys want to just have time with the Lord, you can come down or stay in your seat and just worship for a little longer. But Lord, bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. You guys be blessed. We're just going to continue in worship for a little bit as anybody wants to hang out and do that. Amen. God bless you guys.